do you think of when you think of Kentucky? Rolling hills, bluegrass, thoroughbred horses racing at the Kentucky Derby, which, by the way, is held not too far from here. So next time you come down for the Derby, why don't you add a couple days to your trip and come here to Pleasant Hill, a historic Shaker community that's been frozen in time, about 1850. And you know, if you listen real carefully, you might even hear the Shakers singing. Be sure to ask to see the schoolroom when you come here to Pleasant Hill. It's right off the main hallway of the Center family dwelling. And you know, even though the Shakers were celibate, they did adopt orphan children, and they did accept families who already had children. So they had to be educated. They might sit at a bench like this, in front of this desk, learning their numbers and working with the slate. And to stay warm, they had a little wood stove. And to store all the wood, they had this great wood box. Look at this. And boy, I'll tell you, this thing's seen a lot of use. It's all nicked and dinged. It also has a nice little compartment at the top for some kindling and pegs to hang the tools. Wouldn't it be fun to build one of these? I'd also like to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools safely will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I'll show you how I built today's project. Well, what do you think? Is this a fair representation of the original? I guess I've seen larger wood boxes, but there is enough room for a few pieces of firewood down below and the kindling up here at the top. I like these shaker pegs for hanging the tools on. Now, the first thing I had to do to build this project is make some wide pine panels for the front, a couple for the back, one for the bottom, and some for the sides. Now, it just so happened that I had some pine already here in the shop this pine right here called sugar pine. Nice and wide and clear. But the boards I had were five quarter thickness. I don't want to use them on this project. I'll save them for maybe a tabletop or something. The other problem is that sugar pine is real soft. And being that this wood box is going to take a lot of abuse, I don't think it's the right choice. Now down at the lumber yard, there were a couple different choices. One is this number two common pine, relatively inexpensive, but it has defects, like knots and sometimes splits. And the surface tends to be a little rough, so it takes a lot of preparation before you can paint it. It also shrinks an awful lot. Perhaps the best choice is this material right here, called C or D select pine. Relatively clear and free of knots. But you know, one thing that always happens is that boards vary in thickness, no matter what they are. And so when you glue them together, edge to edge, to make panels like this, they're not even. And you have to spend a lot of time with your belt sander smoothing it all out. I'm going to show you a shortcut using the thickness planer. Okay, now I know that the boards are exactly uniform in thickness. The next step is to cut them to rough lengths on the radial arm saw. Next thing I want to do is orient the boards to each other. And to help minimize cupping in the finished panel, the first thing I look at is the growth rings on the end of each board. This one is curving up. And this one is also curving up. So I'm going to flip it around so that they actually alternate up, down. And looking at this third board, that one is curving up, so we're OK. Now, if this panel was going to be stained or varnished, I might move them around a little bit more because I'm not real happy with the different types of grain running into one another. But since this is going to be painted, it'll be OK. The next thing to check is the joint line between the boards. Now, these don't look too bad, but they're not perfect. And I don't want to use just the clamps to squeeze it together. I want true edges. So I'll sweeten those over on the joiner. 
Now one more thing, and that's so that these boards will stay in the same orientation. I'll just put a little mark across each joint to coat them. One on that one, two on this one. That's pretty good. Now we're ready to put them together. Well, you know, I've been getting an awful lot of kidding about the number of biscuits I use here at the New Yankee Workshop, but I don't think there's a better way to edge join boards together. Now, for the most part, you've seen me make the cuts for the biscuits using this handheld biscuit joiner. But today I'm going to use a bench top model. It's just a motor that runs a belt, and then with a foot-operated device, I can plunge the blade into the work. And there you see the blade as it comes out. And that'll make the half moon slot for the biscuit. Now the advantage of the bench top model over the handheld one is that both hands are free to hold the work in place. And because I'm moving the wood rather than the tool, I can do it a little bit quicker. The layout for the biscuits is fairly straightforward. Just a simple pencil mark across the joints of the board where each biscuit is going to be. I like them about 9 or 10 inches apart. And all I have to do is align the mark with the indicator mark on the tool, and that's all there is to it. It works great. Watch. Now the idea here is to get glue on all the mating surfaces, the edge of the boards, inside the slots, and on the biscuits themselves. Okay, now we just slip the last piece in position. What I want to do here is just put enough clamp pressure on to squeeze a little bit of glue out of the joint. I don't want to clamp it so tightly that all the glue gets squeezed out. Just enough to get a little. Well, you'll notice that I'm in no hurry to wipe off any of this wet glue. I don't want to smear it into the wood. I'll scrape it off later with a paint scraper after it's dried. Now here's some panels that have dried. And now's the time to scrape off that hardened glue. Now, some people have asked me, why scrape it off? Why not just sand it off? The problem with sanding is that it'll gum up your belts or the disc very quickly, and sometimes it'll even just tear them so they're immediately ruined. The scraper is really the best way. Now, because of the care I took earlier, I'm not going to have to use my belt sander to do the final cleanup. I'm just going to use my random orbit sander, which is a relatively new tool to the woodworking trade. But because of its random motion, it leaves no swirl marks, and it's pretty fast. Well, with the panel sanded, the next thing I want to do is joint this back edge so that it's straight and square. Now with the back edge true and straight, I can now ride it up against my rip fence, which I've set at 15 and 7 eighths inches to cut the front. Well, the next step is to square up the bottom edge of the side panel. And to do that, I'm going to use my homemade panel cutter, which simply rides in the miter gauge slot. It does a great job. Now I'll just mark the side for the height, which is 32 and a half inches, and trim that off. Now 
Now with the side pieces clamped in my bench vise with the back edge and the bottom nice and even, I can lay out for the side cut. I'm just using a cardboard template that I made. Just set it in place and trace it out. Now to make the cut, I suppose I could use my bandsaw, but this portable jigsaw will do just fine. Now the drum sander attachment in my drill press does a real good job smoothing out the curved surfaces. Now I can't quite get this little corner right here, so I'll clean that up with a wood rasp back at the bench vise. Okay, with that cleaned up, now we'll just round off the edges using the router. To make that round over, I'm using a 3 8 inch radius round over bit, but I've only exposed part of the cutting edge because I just want a slight round over. Once again, I'm using the rasp to get into the area that the router can't reach. Let's take a look at our prototype again. Take note that the front and bottom of the box for the kindling is let into the sides. They sit in little dados. Now, I'll cut those dados using a little template block, which I've clamped in place, and my router which is equipped with a collar and a half-inch straight cutting bit. And how it really works is that the collar will ride up against the edge of the guide block, locating the dado in the right position. Now, what I have to be careful about is that I keep steady pressure against the block or I'll wander off and ruin the piece. You'll note that so far the dado that I've cut is only a half inch wide and my stock is three quarters of an inch thick. So by using a slightly smaller guide block, you'll see that the end result is a dado that's of sufficient width. Now I'll just square off the corner that the router couldn't get to using a nice sharp chisel. Now let me show you the details at the bottom of the wood box. I recess the bottom slightly, about a half inch, and it sits in dados which are set in the sides, and that gives it some strength. But it floats between the front and back pieces and that's because if it sat in a dado, it would restrict these pieces from shrinking, and they'd probably split. So I'll cut the dados in the sides using my table saw, which I've set up with a stacked dado head cutter. It's set for a three-quarter inch width and about a quarter inch depth. Now, when I dimension the piece for length, I have to have the dimension between the two sides plus the combined depth of the dados, which is an additional half inch. Now, 
Now, before I size the front and back panels for the wood box, I have to do a sub-assembly. And the first thing I do is glue and nail the bottom in place. Well, now I'm ready to put the front of the kindling box on. And there's no glue here because I have perpendicular grains and I want this front to be able to expand and contract. Now for the bottom of the piece that goes on the kindling box, I can put a little glue along the front edge and in the dado because the grains are all running parallel to one another. All right, now with that part of the subassembly completed, I can now get accurate measurements for the front and back panels. Okay, that takes care of cutting the front and back panels to size. Now one thing about these panels is that when I attach them, I don't want to use any glue because I have what's known as a cross grain situation. The front panel has its grain running horizontally, as well as the back panels. But the side, the grain runs vertically. If I use any glue to secure this joint, it's going to cause problems. The front panel will try to shrink and possibly split. Now, nails alone won't add very much strength to this joint. The wood box could still rack. I suppose I could use dovetail joinery, but that's a little fancy for a wood box. So I've done something a little simpler. I've just made a rabbit joint at the edge of each panel, and I'll make that cut over on the table saw. Well, you'll notice that it's not a very deep rabbit. It's only about an eighth of an inch, but that little shoulder will add a lot of strength to the wood box. Now, this little ledge along the front of the wood box protects the front panel. It will take a fair amount of abuse. And I have to notch it into the side panels, removing a little bit of material right here at the top front corner. And to do that, I'm going to use my back saw. <laughs> I've just rounded over the front edge and the ends of that ledge. And I'll just fasten it in place with a few finish nails. Now the lid for the kindling box starts out as a piece of one by eight. And it has a nice bullnosed edge. Now you might think that you can make that bullnose with your handheld router, but you can't. Watch. Now the first pass isn't a problem because the bearing on my router has a place to ride. It gives me a nice rounded edge. But watch what happens when I do the other side. Because the bearing didn't have a square edge to ride on, I ended up with a lip. So I'm going to have to use my router table, which is set up with the same router bit but because it has a fence to guide the edge of the board, 
it'll do the job. I've just ripped the top into two pieces. The narrow piece is the fixed portion of the lid, and the wide piece is the operating part. Now let's mortise the hinges in. OK. Now to mortise out for the hinges, I've made a little template. Simply a piece of 3 quarter inch plywood with some little strips nailed on the front to align it with the face of the board. And I've made a little notch. And the notch is a sixteenth of an inch larger than the mortise I need for the hinge. And that's to take into account the difference between the size of the collar that I have on my router and the bit itself. The collar simply rides on the inside of the notch. It does a great job. Just a little cleaning out of the corners with a nice sharp chisel. And we'll check the fit of the hinge. That's good. Now all I have to do is fasten the entire assembly to the top of the box with a few finish nails. OK. Now I'll just drill a couple half-inch holes in the sides for the shaker pegs. Yeah. Now, how about a paint job for our old-time wood box? Now I'm just wiping it down with a damp rag to clean off any loose dust. And that's called for in the instructions for our milk paint, which is something that's been around since the Egyptian days. And now you can buy it in these old-timey colors. It comes in a can as a powder. And you just simply mix it with water. And it, as you can see, it goes on showing some of the grain through. It is actually made from milk lime, clay, and earth pigment for the color. Oh, this is interesting. Look at this. As the paint dries, it becomes more opaque. I kind of like that look. It's kind of chalky. All right, this stuff is real interesting. As I put the second coat on, I can see the green showing through again. I wonder what it's going to look like when it's all finely dry. Yeah, look at that. Just enough room in the top for enough kindling to get the fire started and plenty of firewood below for a nice, cozy evening fire.